The texts I have for you today are Job 3.23. So if you would turn with me to Job 3.23. Job is before Psalms. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? Genesis chapter 40, verse 8. And they said to him, We each have had a dream and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. And Daniel, chapter 2, verse 19. Then... The secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Father God in heaven, honor to your name. May your name be glorified. May your word give us wisdom. It says, your word says that as you're the diviner of, of hearts, separating the joint from the marrow. Father, reach into our hearts with this word. May we know you better. May we know ourselves better. That we may truly, truly be a living testimony to you. Amen. I need something else. Where's my purse? Excuse me for a second. So we talked about Daniel, too. So I was having this conversation with my sister the other day. And I said, did you notice that the book that Daniel has a very ex similar experience to Joseph? Has anybody else noticed this? Yeah, and captured and being successful. I don't really ever hear anybody talk about that. And it's so funny. I, I went to seminary. And do you know I did not notice that until earlier this week? For some reason, it just didn't click. This is the first lesson of Bible study. You can read the Bible umpteen times, and the most obvious connections, sometimes you just miss. We wonder, how was Daniel, going back to chapter 1, it says that Daniel purposed in his heart. How did he know to do that? He had an example. He had Joseph to think about. Now, the decisions that Joseph made, you all know the story of Joseph, right? It's in, it's in Genesis. So it's in the very first book of the Bible, which makes sense. Daniel doesn't have all the stuff we have. He just has Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He has Joshua. He has Judges. He has Ruth. He has 1st and 2nd Samuel, right? Yeah, yeah. 1st and 2nd Kings, maybe. I'm not sure. 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, no. 2nd Chronicles is being written. So he doesn't have that yet because he's living there. <laughs> okay? Because Babylon comes. Nebuchadnezzar comes in 2nd Chronicles. And so he's got parts of that. Okay, and he has, let's see, who else does he have? He has Isaiah, right? Jeremiah's around his same time, so he didn't really have him yet. No, he does. He does because we know he was studying Jeremiah. So he's got Jeremiah. Okay, so this is who Daniel has to work with. There's no New Testament, no gospel writers. 
okay? None, none of those people. No Esther, because she comes right shortly thereafter him, okay? So he looks, he searches. He says, I got a problem in my life. He had been studying these things, and I'm sure he heard the story of Joseph. Now, like I said, Joseph's story is a little bit different. Oh, he has the book of Job. I forgot. He has the book of Job. This is important. Now, what happens to Joseph? Joseph is loved and protected, right? Daniel, loved and protected. He's one of the descendants of the king. Okay? Joseph unexpectedly gets taken from his family by his own brothers, dumped in a pit, and sold into slavery. Finds him to, to some relatives, by the way, <laughs> to some cousins. Imagine your first cousins, your second cousins, who you see every now and again, they sell you. Okay. So he goes off, gets sold to Egypt. Man buys him. And Joseph does well. Wow. So Daniel has this example of something bad happening to him, of being a slave, and how God delivered someone else who was in slavery, even though it's a different circumstance. What choice does Joseph make when he gets sold into slavery? He makes a couple of choices. One, he serves with loyalty and hard work, right? He's very, he's, what is the word, the two words that I, I thought of were, he's honest and he has integrity. So Daniel knows that if he is going to follow God, the example he has of someone who follows God is someone who has honesty and integrity no matter what the circumstances. And no matter who his boss is, no matter how the boss became the boss, okay? Some of you got bosses that shouldn't be your bosses, but guess what? You still got to be honest and have integrity. Okay? You couldn't have a boss as bad as Nebuchadnezzar who might burn down your house and kill your family. Okay? Now, honesty and integrity. We see this because Joseph gets sold to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officers. And Potiphar begins to trust Joseph so much he puts his entire household all of his other servants, all of his stuff, all of his money under Joseph's control. Sound like somebody we know. Daniel, not knowing if he's going to be so have so much favor, doesn't know that God has given him the same kind of favor. We see that in chapter 1. That God brought Daniel into favor with the chief of the eunuchs. But Daniel doesn't know, but he's remembering the story of Joseph. And then Joseph has a situation. The wife of Potiphar thinks he's really hot. And she decides that her husband apparently has gone too much or he just doesn't make her happy. So she decides she's going to hook up with Joseph. And Joseph is like, whoo-hoo, yeah, no. Um, I can't do that. And I like what he says. He says, how can I do this? I have all of this responsibility Okay, and the only thing that your husband hasn't given me is you. I can't do that. And so she says that he has attacked her because he ends up, she won't give up. He has to run away from her. Like literally, she grabs his clothes. He's like, I got to go. He runs so far away from her, she takes off his robe. Now, they didn't wear much more in Egypt. So he ran away from her naked. Okay? <laughs> Just ran. She uses that against him. She uses his integrity against him. And guess what happens to Joseph? He ends up in prison. Okay? He gets thrown into prison with, Pharaoh's criminals. I wonder if that's like the worst of the worst. I'm not sure, but it sounds like it. And you know, God has a funny way of turning things around. And if, if you want to know where I'm at, I actually am in Genesis chapter 40. And so you could go read that later. Um, and the story 
Joseph's story starts in 37. Okay? And Joseph, again, now he finds himself with another boss. Okay? He finds himself under the control of the uh, warden. Okay? And he's again honest and has integrity. And so guess what? The warden puts the whole prison and all the prisoners under his care. Okay, so I think the first lesson I can find is no matter what circumstance I find, even if I'm the lowest person on the totem pole, God is going to make sure I take care of some other people. He's going to put me in a position to care for other people. He's going to give me responsibility, and somebody's going to recognize that. And they're going to be like, they're not stupid. They're going to be like, oh, this person won't lie to me. This person is trustworthy. They don't steal. They don't kill. They don't cheat. They don't abuse the other people so I can trust them, and that person's going to give you responsibility and have favor on you. Do you know who that's going to be? No. But it is inevitable. My dad told me something when I was little, and he says, people may not like you because you're black. They might not like you because you're a woman. They might not like you for a lot of things. He says, but if you can make them money, they will like you. <laughs> it's a very a little bit cynical. But it has a lot of truth in it. And um, so Daniel doesn't know he's going to live this situation. All he knows, and Daniel must think, my situation's not as bad as Joseph's. Joseph, Pharaoh has a dream. Let's look at this. Let's look at chapter 40 because it's going to remind you of something. First, those, there's these, uh, there's these uh, criminals from Pharaoh in chapter 40, verse 8, and they say, you know, we each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Okay, they tell him their dream. He interprets it. And in verse 14, he says, but remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me, and make mention of me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this place. Now, you will find yourself in places you don't want to be. Don't try to stay there. Okay? You know, the, Joseph didn't say, okay, I'm happy here. No, don't lie to yourself. If it's terrible, it's terrible. Get out. But guess what? They didn't remember Joseph. And like two years later, one of the guys, the chief baker, he dies. Terrible dream is foretold to him. But the cupbearer, he gets promoted and he's all happy. And two years later, the cupbearer remembers him. Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh, now look at chapter 41, verse 8. Genesis chapter 41, verse 8. And it says, Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt. And all its wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Remind you of someone? Nebuchadnezzar. Who did he call? All the wise men, the Chaldeans, the magicians. But no one could interpret the dream. But Pharaoh... This is so interesting. Because Pharaoh's nicer than Neb. Nebuchadnezzar. I call him Neb for short. He's nicer. He doesn't go to kill all his magicians. I find this very interesting. <laughs> but but the, the cupbearer says, hey, you know, I, I remember this guy. He says, I messed up. And I like, this tells me something about the cupbearer's uh, character. 
He says, I remember my faults this day. He had honestly forgotten about Joseph. And now he tells Pharaoh about what happened. And so then in verse 14, Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him out quickly of the dungeon and he was shaved, changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. Okay, so now if you find yourself in a terrible situation and then you suddenly get called out of it, don't look like you just were in a terrible situation. Clean yourself up. Go in looking like you know something. Go in, represent God well. Take off the sackcloth and ashes, the sorrowful face because you've been suffering. Clean yourself up and step out in faith. Okay? And Pharaoh says to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. But I heard it said of you that you understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now tells you something about Joseph because what did Daniel say when the king called him to interpret his dream, right? So Daniel tells in chapter Daniel chapter 2, keep your hand over in Genesis 2. I mean, Genesis 40 as well. And it says they, verse 18, chapter 2 says, they might seek mercies from God of heaven concerning the secret. Then um, skip over to uh, verse 28, chapter 2, verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And then in verse 29, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. And verse 30, but as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king. He immediately, immediately says God has the interpretation just like Joseph. Immediately. He doesn't say, well, you know, I studied really well in, in Jerusalem before you destroyed it. He doesn't say, you know, I, I got a couple degrees. I, I, am, I was ten times better than all your other magicians. All of those things would have been true. But he doesn't say that. He says there's a God in heaven. Just like Joseph, he says it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh the interpretation. The example is, when you follow God, you will find yourself in very bad circumstances. But then somebody's going to come to you for the answer that no one else can give. These are terrible times. People are confused. Just like in the time of Joseph, Leaders are confused. In the time of Daniel, leaders are confused, and no one has the answer. But God's children have the answer. You know why? Because they have God. They have his revelation in Jesus Christ. They know the answer because they know the God, and it's not in us to give the interpretation, but we know a God who can give the interpretation to us to give to them. In the end times, things will get more confusing. And people are going to want to answer. You want to apply this to your life. You are going to be placed in situations you didn't ask to be in, in positions of responsibility that you do not want, in a place you don't want to be at, at a time when you'd rather not exist. Okay? So basically, you're not going to want to be wherever you are at all. And you're going to be the only person who can point them to God. You're going to be the only person with the answer. And it's not because you're smart. It's just because you happen to know God, which is not by chance. Your circumstance is not by chance. Even though it's unpleasant, you are there to be a blessing. And you are there to be saved yourself. Now, I want to compare and contrast the situation when I talk about chaos 
Joseph's situation is a little more clear cut than Daniel's situation. Joseph didn't do anything to get taken by his brothers. He didn't, other than maybe he was a brat. Maybe. That's unclear. He got taken. God wasn't angry at him, but he got taken and put in a situation. Daniel's in a different situation where his people are under the direct punishment of God. God has allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come and take over Israel. And some texts say he caused it to happen. Now, he didn't intend for their suffering to be as bad as it was. And that doesn't mean Babylon is going to escape punishment because Babylon gets punished for being evil to Israel. <laughs> okay? It's complicated. All right? So Daniel's circumstance is a little bit more confusing and more dangerous in many regards because he doesn't have a pharaoh who's just like frustrated and doesn't know the answer. He's got Nebuchadnezzar who's so frustrated he's ready to kill people. A whole lot, hundreds of people because he can't answer his own dream. It's more confusing. He's got a king. Pharaoh's not asking Joseph to worship anybody. Pharaoh doesn't care. Nebuchadnezzar is trying, has, is trying to force a change of worship on Daniel and his friends, to change their complete mindset. And he's surrounded by it to the point where he can't speak his own language anymore. So Daniel has a harder situation. He's, he's got more chaos because there's more problems. When your life's in danger, it's harder to think more clearly. It's more stressful. That's the word. You might say there's more stress. Same amount of waiting and patience. Joseph waited two years. Daniel had to be three years in training. Longer time, more kinds of stress from different places. And God is speaking. How We are in a time, and we think Daniel's time is worse, but that is not so. Daniel might have thought Joseph's time was worse. Daniel's like, I'm not in prison. <laughs> Let me tell you, worse is whatever your situation is. <laughs> That's bad, okay? It's not a comparison. We find ourselves in a situation today where there's, all kind, there's one God, but everybody's got a different perspective on who he is, where there's different versions of the Bible that aren't all consistent, where we know more Hebrew and more Greek, but we have less knowledge of God because we have so much information about God. This doesn't make any sense. Nobody's claiming, well, we got a few people who dance around and are pagan. We got a few people like that. But our hardest problem is not them. Some of them are the nicest people. Our hardest problem is the people who say they worship the same God, but really don't. They've defined him in special ways. They go to church with us. They are some of our bosses and our leaders in the church and outside of the church and in our political arena. How do you fight against people who say on the surface that we are all the same? That's confusing. Who went through this? Guess what? Did you know Daniel and Job are connected too? Turn with me to the book of Job. It's the book right before Psalms. And Job is actually the oldest book of the Bible. And if you look at Job chapter 4, there's another vision. Job chapter 4, and Job's friend Eliphaz says in chapter 4, verse 12, now a word was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a whisper of it, in disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep falls on men. 
Fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, and the hair on my body stood up. Woo! Sounds like some show on television. And then, I'm not going to go and you can read the rest yourself. Eliphaz goes in to tell Job, uh, basically, how wonderful God is and how Job must have sinned and done wrong. It sounds like Eliphaz knows exactly what he's talking about. Did he not get a vision? Where did the vision come from? Well, we know the end of the story of Job because God says that all your friends are wrong. Eliphaz is wrong and all his other friends are wrong. And Job has to ask for forgiveness, particularly for Eliphaz and the other friends. In these times, people are going to have visions and dreams and you have to discern which ones are from God and which ones are from the spirit that makes your hair stand on end. Okay? This is different. Daniel just had a killer king who had a vision from God. There was no questioning where the vision came from. It was clear. You are in a situation, I am in a situation, where we have to discern where the vision comes from, where the word comes from. If somebody next to you was asleep, wake them up. Wake them up. I don't usually do this because I think you must be tired. But if somebody next to you is asleep, wake them up. This is very important. You need to survive mentally and in your relationship with God. Stay awake. Do not fall asleep. If you find, pinch yourself, slap yourself in the face. You have to discern between the voice of God and the voice of the adversary that's around you speaking at the same time. You have to know they're both talking. Daniel has to struggle. And that's why the book is written, because of the chaos that we are going to have. We'll look at the other books of chapters of Daniel, and he gets so worried about our time that he faints. How are we going to discern between the voice of God and the voice of the evil one? Every voice that you hear that sounds good is not from God. God has a word against the prophets that prophesy lies. So guess what? There are prophets that will lie to you. Okay? If you look at, I'm going to find, I actually wrote it down. Ezekiel, which is connected to Daniel, by the way. Ezekiel. Oh, Deuteronomy, my apologies. Deuteronomy, Ezekiel's for something else. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Yes, chapter 18, verse 21. Verse 20, um... 18, oh, I turned the wrong one. Oh, yeah, 21 and 22. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. And the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Okay, so you got to make sure it doesn't happen. But sometimes you don't have time to figure that out. Okay, this is true. That is my, that's what I wanted by my Ezekiel text. Let me see if that was Ezekiel 14. Well, I will find it, or I will share it with you after the sermon is over. But in Ezekiel, it talks about, and you, actually, you guys have all heard this. Someone might find it for me. They prophesy peace and safety, but there is no peace and safety. People will talk about God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. And it's true, it's true, it's true. He loves you when you sin, but guess what? You will suffer because of your sins. 
If you jump out of a plane without a parachute, you will fall and you will crash to the ground. And if you don't die, you will break every bone in your body. And then you will be in traction in the hospital if you should survive. You will suffer some pain. And God still loves you. There is a, this is, this is, well, so when you're looking for the word from the Lord, and then the other lesson you see from Job, is there are hard questions when people, people want to give you quick answers. They say, oh, well, you're suffering. Did you do something wrong? You might have. You might not have. Guess who can answer that question? You. Only you and God know. Job knew in his heart he hadn't done anything wrong. Because he repented, he sacrificed for his kids regularly, he knew he was forgiven, that's why he could say he was righteous. Because he was righteous in the God who he believed in, that's how he could say those things. And we know because God calls him righteous. Now his friends don't know, which is why they were being presumptuous and they kept saying, you must have sinned. No! Bad things happen because we live in a world on a planet covered in sin. And it falls on the good and it falls on the bad. And, I, and Job says something really, really wonderful that I really, really liked. And it, it's... It's not the one. I found a bunch of things. Job chapter 6, verse 14. To him, Job chapter 6, verse 14. To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. What? If Job's friends had been true friends, they wouldn't have become accusers. They wouldn't have said, this is all your fault. They wouldn't have said, God doesn't let bad things happen to good people, because that's not true. We know. We have actual clarity, because Jesus Christ, who was perfect, died on a cross. <laughs> Daniel knew. He had the book of Job. He knew that the choices that his, his, his ancestors made, he was not responsible for, even though he suffered for them. He knew that God was still on his side even though he was suffering for the sins of other people. I, I should say consequences of other people. So he could trust that God would have some favor on him in the situation. This is complex stuff. People try to make it seem like follow the Ten Commandments, you'll be saved, go to church on Sabbath, don't kill, don't steal, don't hate, you'll be good. Okay? You want to be ready for Jesus to come, you got to pray three times a day, you got to keep the feast days, you got to do all these things. Guess what? You keep all them things and you will not be ready for the end times. The only thing that makes you ready, shoot, forget the end times, the only thing that makes you ready for your current life is to know Jesus here now and today. That's it. You know that song? Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray hallelujah. Why is, why is the hallelujah there? Because you can't put oil in your own lamp. Only God can put the oil in there, and he put some in, and so then you can say, oh, there's some oil in there. <laughs> hallelujah. Yeah, keep me burning till the break of day. I love that. I learned that in vacation Bible school. <laughs> The plug for vacation Bible school. Keep me burning till the break of day. What's the break of day when the sun of righteousness arises mm -hmm. in your heart? And when he arises, and he comes from the east. What's that old prophecy say? You look for the cloud in the east about the size of a man's hand coming. And it gets bigger and bigger. And then you see the angels. And you hear the trumpet call. And the ground begins to shake. I'm all super, I'm getting all excited, but I got to stop because there's something I got to tell you. How are you going to know that even that prophecy is true? You could be waiting for a lie. <laughs> the test 
Test it. Jesus says, test the spirits in 1 John chapter 4. Test the spirits. Matthew 7, 16. A good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. Do you find apples on a thistle tree? This is another text. But you don't find apples on a thorn bush, do you? Look at their life. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Joseph was a man of peace. Where the house he served in, he kept the peace. He loved the owner, treated him with love. Love is not just a feeling, it's a set of actions where you protect and care for someone. Okay? where you have honesty and integrity in everything that you do with regards to someone else. That's loving them. Daniel, when he deals with Nebuchadnezzar, when he deals with the wise men, D Daniel, one of the first things Daniel said is, don't kill the wise men. Don't kill them. I'd have been like, I'll get to be on top. If you kill all of them, it'll just be me and my boys. I got three girlfriends, so I'd be like, all right, about the boys. But me and my girls, right, we will be the top. He doesn't do that. He loves them. He protects them. He says, don't kill them. I have the interpretation. The Lord has given me the interpretation of the dream. Take me to the king. The people who stand at the end time have character integrity and honor no matter what the circumstance they find themselves in stressed or unstressed angry or unangry happy or sad being treated unfairly they still act in love to their enemies to their friends they still have honesty and integrity at all times and they get that from God he gives it to them. Because guess what? You don't know how you're going to act under stress. You just don't know. All you can do is choose God in that moment and trust he's going to put oil in your lamp. Okay? And then guess what? Oh, man, I just totally thought this was super cool. He gives you oil in the lamp. You guys remember the prophecy? I think it's in Ezekiel. And it has the two olive trees that are bringing oil in um, into the sanctuary. And we, 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 we interpret that as being the, the commandments. We can't keep the commandments. God has to give oil into our hearts. The Holy Spirit, the oil represents the Holy Spirit into us. And then we keep the law. We love our neighbor as ourselves. And we love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. That comes from him who reveals secrets, and then when you find yourself under stress and confusion and it's not clear and they come to you for the answer because no one else knows, you can say, I know a God in heaven. Give me some time. My God will answer. And they will know based on your life of honor and integrity, they can give you that time. And if they don't give you that time, it's their loss. You pray for them and you know God will show up for you either in a cloud in heaven or in the moment in the fiery furnace. We didn't get to chapter 3 yet, but we'll get there. Test the spirits, character. Test the prophecy by the scripture, by the word of other prophets. They can be in your church. They can be in scripture. Look at scripture. Compare. Is it consistent with scripture? When I go to look at Joseph, I look at the story of Daniel. I compare the two. Isn't that what I just did? That's what you do. Remember the Bible stories. Bring them together. As we're looking at prophecy, Daniel's a, a book of wisdom first. Wisdom is discerning. Finding connections between things that you don't recognize is connected. Prophecy is doing the same thing. Seeing where God is moving and you don't necessarily recognize he's moving in those places. Bringing those things together. Okay? 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29 says, If by the word of two or three prophets as a prophet judged. This is how you test the spirits. If someone thing is speaking in your ear. And this is the last test. Is it real? Does it tell you to stop asking God questions and look at it yourself? Or does it tell you to keep seeking God for the answers? Mm -hmm. If it tells you to keep looking at yourself, you have a problem. That is not from God. If it tells you to look up God, look at God. Does it say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and he came in the flesh and he died for you? Look to him. You got an indication. That's a message from God. If he is the Savior. Okay? So any doctrine that you may ever hear that that seems to talk about your work saving you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you'll make it to the kingdom they're lying to you if they tell you that your life will get better if you just straighten up and fly right that's a half truth so that didn't come from God God said if you look to me and you talk to me I'll enable you to make right choices I will strengthen you to follow up on those choices. I'll pull you up by your bootstraps and I'll walk with you while you walk to get you to your destination and your destiny. This is truth. God is not going to give you a half prophecy. He's going to give you a full prophecy. He's going to give you a full word that's true completely. And I was kind of asking God why he really wanted me to spend this much time on chapter 2. Because to understand the prophecies that are coming, that are in the second half of chapter 2, you have to have a firm foundation of who are the people who exist at the end of time. Because that's what's important. Who will you be? Who are you today? Because today is the end. You have to know your God. Be firmly grounded on the rock and hold to him like that song said. The mountain. The mountain, the rock that hits the statue at the bottom of his feet and becomes a mountain. You want to be on the mountain. You want to be on the mountain. Know your God. And then when you look at the prophecies, you will have a firm foundation to actually understand them as good news to everyone. Not against anyone, but for them, to save them. And when you give them the end time message, you will give it to them like Daniel gave it to Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar was faced. And he said, break off from your sins, O king, and do righteousness. Break off from your sins, and God will have mercy. When, you, when we bring the message, we must bring the message in love and in truth. But that's only going to come from practicing honesty and integrity in all the aspects of our lives. And how do we do that? We choose God, and then he works it out. So when we get in those situations where we're stressed, our, we're not tempted to lie to cover we trust God and we tell the truth. We learn tact. We learn wisdom. And that's how we understand the prophecies. And we also need to understand the connections between those old Bible stories of Joseph. Because they, they're in the prophecies of the, the golden head that passes. The silver shoulders that pass. Okay, the belly and the thighs of bronze that pass. But notice how things get worse and worse and worse and more and more confusing till you get to the toes where we have clay and iron mixed together. Confusion. But yet, the iron is still distinct from the clay. And in the end, it all gets destroyed by the God. Mm -hmm. And he builds up a new kingdom and a new mountain mm -hmm. that fills the whole earth. 
But before you get there, be clear on who your God is. Be clear on what it is to have the fruit and the spirit of your God. And then you will interpret the prophecies rightly. And you will share them and people will be converted by the word out of your mouth mm -hmm. because it's not you. It's God, the revealer of secrets. I want to ask that, um, I'm going to ask a question. Last week I preached on Daniel too. Don't raise your hand, but just think about this. Who went during that week and read Jan Daniel chapter 2? Just to see if I was making up stuff. Who went and read it? Think about that. I just went over Daniel chapter 2 again, and then I gave you verses from Genesis. Okay? I gave you a whole bunch of verses that I didn't even quote. I want to challenge you. I want you to be like the Bereans who went back and studied and searched the scriptures. I think it's Acts 17, 11. And they were better than the Thessalonians because when they heard Paul preach, they went back and they searched the scriptures diligently. You go back to Daniel chapter 2 this week. You read Daniel chapter 2 and you see what God shows you. I got, you got to read it over and over again. That was the lesson last week, reading the text, reading it in context, making connections with other stories. You must do that at home. Find the time. That's what my challenge is to you and the commitment that I'm asking from you is to read Daniel chapter 2. And in addition to whatever else you see that reminds you of other texts, and then we'll be ready to move on. So please, read Daniel chapter 2. Come back with questions in your mind. Pray through those. Let's have some questions and, and go forward. That's the request I ask of you. Choose God and read Daniel chapter 2. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, the God who dwells with men, my God who walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear it fall on our ears and be able to tell that it's your voice and not an enemy. Encourage us to seek your face, to read your word, to know you, like you know us. Give us the joy of your salvation. Give us a knowledge of you that we will not be moved, but we will hold on to the mountain that you are. And we will have the faith, the faith of Jesus. Oh, Lord, give us oil in our lamps. Give us oil this week. This I pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus.